So um, now it falls to me to introduce very briefly uh, Jonathan Adams, who's going to give us the opening keynote. I'm not going to read you his bio because it's already in your pack. So I'm simply going to welcome Jonathan up to the stage, as uh, I hope you will as well. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> my name's Jonathan Adams. Um, I don't think I know very many of you. Um, I was, I've just borrowed this uh, off Mark because um, I spend a lot of my time talking to researchers who write and very little time talking to reviewers, publishers, and distributors. So this is an opportunity for me to expose some of the other things that we do around the research process to you in uh, your part of the uh, research ecosystem. And <clears throat> I do see this as very much uh, an integrated uh, ecosystem. But let me first tell you about the organization I work for, which is ISI. That's the Institute for Scientific Information some of you may know a little bit about it. Most of you will have heard of ISI at one time or another, but you won't necessarily know quite where we are at the present. So it was founded by Gene Garfield to enable search and discovery of a burgeoning scientific literature back in the 1950s. And it created the Science Citation Index, which then eventually transformed in the 1990s into the Web of Science. And it also has continuously supported original research in our area. We are now part of Clarivate Group. Uh, within Clarivate, uh, we are closely attached to the Web of Science Group, and we perform a sort of university role within that. So we aren't directly associated with any of the products or services, but we support a lot of those, and we do the university thing of teaching administration research, that we tell people about what's people inside the company as well as outside the company about what our data are, uh, what they can be used for, and how that should be done. And we also do research on our own systems in order to try and make sure that that's actually what happens, um, which is largely true, but not always. Um, and so we spend quite a lot of time on administration, which really means um, uh, trying to liaise between the different parts of our company to bring all of that together in an effective way. And of course, a huge amount of that connects with the things that you do. Some of the work that we do is purely internal. Some of it uh, does end up being paid consultancy outside. A lot of it appears in pro bono reports. And <clears throat> if you've been to the website, then you can see that you can download all of these. Um, we publish a report of some kind um, every couple of months. We have one coming out uh, this week um, on how people use the web of science for things other than search and discovery. Uh, last year, we published what I think is a very useful report on profiles, not metrics, explaining why people should always take a multifaceted approach to using the web of science data um, and not use simplistic indicators as they tend to do a lot of the time, uh, particularly, of course, journal impact factor. But there's a range of other reports there as well. Um, one on Plan S will be of interest to people here. Uh, one last autumn on hyper-authorship and its consequences, which we're following up on. Uh, we're also looking at the problem of exceptional citation rates, which I'll come back to later. Um, and we have some papers coming out on uh, the diversity of research and how that's evolved over the years. Um, and we have a major report coming out in uh, probably June this year on our journals um, and some of the background to the journal database. Okay, <clears throat> so today, um, in the time that I have left, uh, what I want to uh, talk about is how the research ecosystem is changing and how that uh, affects all of us in what we do, how it affects researchers, uh, the effect that that then has on the way in which they write and present the outcomes of their research, the problems that uh, are created for editors and reviewers, 
the challenges for publishers in determining uh, what should be published, how it should be published, and how it's made available, and what I think is a, a, a rising and intense problem about uh, citation patterns um, and uh, the way in which there are uh, people intervening in the system in unfortunate ways. And like any ecosystem, and I should explain that <coughs> I started life as um, an ecologist. Um, so for 10 years I did ecology research, which is why I tend to invoke um, images of this sort. Um, we've got producers, consumers, symbionts, competitors. You're all competitors in one way or another. We have predators taking over publishing houses. But we also, within the system, not in this room, I hope, uh, we have parasites, and it's the parasites who are disrupting the system, I think, uh, and bringing serious new challenges to what we do. And all of the different things that are going on, and I hope that a lot of this will actually be pretty familiar to you. I hope that what I'm, what I'm going to do is to throw in some more specific data background, but the general elements of this thesis will be fairly familiar ground. That we have essentially a climate change which is threatening a lot of business as usual as we've understood it over a very long period. And unless we all cooperate in the different parts of the system in addressing that and thinking about ways in which those changes can be managed and mitigated, then I think we have quite seriously a, a real problem in the breakdown of the scholarly research publication process and the value that it's presented to the research system over uh, decades, if not centuries. The things that I want to touch on are the change in the number of researchers around the world. There are vastly more researchers than there used to be. So there's more people reading, there's more people writing, producing papers all the time, and often under a lot of pressure to write and to get published in particular venues. Communications technology has transformed the research world in lots of ways so that people are able to collaborate over enormous distances, but that also raises all sorts of questions about where the IP actually belongs when people are located in many different places. The number of journal articles each year is rising rapidly. There are more journals, journals are getting larger, it's increasingly difficult to know everything that's being published, it's increasingly difficult to know whether something has been published before, it's increasingly difficult to identify the value of some new manuscript that's presented to you. At the same time, the criteria under which people operate are changing because we have a shift from a long period of emphasis on research excellence towards an emphasis on research impact, where impact is seen not in academic terms, but in socioeconomic terms. And that presents new challenges, very desirable opportunities for people to establish the value of their work. But because that is new, great difficulty in deciding what the criteria are that determine that value. And then on top of that, we also have the disruption of open access which is not just open access publishing, but also the idea that people should actually provide openly their research proposals before they even start to get funded, their data after they've been funded, and all sorts of challenges how, about how you then uh, control all of that information. An image here of how much the world has changed starts off inevitably with the England cricket team. I haven't got an image which shows a researcher in the 1960s traveling to a conference. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd use this instead. When the England team went out to Australia in the 62-63 season, they traveled by steamer. It took weeks to get there. And also reflecting the system at that time, Fred Truman, who you will recall destroyed Australia in successive innings at Headingley, was made to travel separately from the rest of the team because he was a player and not a gentleman. And this is the England team passing a medicine ball, I guess, backwards as they exercise on deck on the way there. 
This is the Materials, Science and Technology Conference in Singapore last year, at which we presented a report and spoke. Everybody flew into Singapore's amazing airport. Thousands of delegates arrived from all over the world. The opening session had two Nobel laureates. There were actually four Nobelists at the conference overall. There's an amazing conference hall there at the hotel on the bay, which has got a uh, casino in the shape of a boat on top of the main pillars of the hotel, and uh, an absolutely beautiful botanic gardens uh, area just behind, looking out to sea. So the world really has changed enormously over 50, 60 years, and we have to accommodate that. Changes include the volume of research because of the increase in the number of people. This is an old slide from a report that we did for Universities UK about uh, eight or nine years ago, but it shows the increase in the number of researchers in this country. We have an increase in the number of uh, PhD awards, rising year on year, which led to pressure for more researcher positions. If we go back to the 1970s, there were very few postdoctoral researchers in the system. Now there are tens of thousands of them. All of them are competing for permanent jobs in the research system. In order to get those jobs, they need to publish in the right places. They need to publish in a lot of the right places. There is intense competition to produce the results that will get you a publication slot in the key journals in your area. So there's massively intense competition as well as a hugely increased volume of activity. So national output has risen and risen over the period. The gray line is the EU total, which has now well exceeded the US total output. And alongside that, we have the emergence of many new research economies. Ten years ago, we were talking about the BRICS generally, Brazil, Russia, India, China, Korea. But China has gone on and on expanding. The output from China has now overtaken, on the web of science data, has now overtaken the US. And the key thing about that red line is that it's still on an upward curve. It shows no sign of plateauing. The research output of China is enormous, and we're only covering that part of it which is in journals that have their article titles and abstracts in English. There is also a huge separate output which is wholly in Chinese, and which only some of us have access to, and the volume of that exceeds the volume that you can see here. So the world is changing a great deal, and there are the pressures that I referred to on English researchers are replicated possibly even more intensely on Chinese researchers and researchers elsewhere amongst the emerging research economies. The quality of research at the high end, as I'm sure many of you are entirely aware, is outstanding. This is not poor quality research. It's really, really top end, but it further increases the competitiveness of the system. So the global output has gone up from 1981, when we had half a million papers a year being indexed and we were covering fewer than 7,000 journals. Now we have three times the number of journals five times the number of papers. That's an enormous amount of research output to try and absorb on an annual basis. We have 145,000 researchers every day trying to do that. Alongside the increase in volume is enormous increase in internationalism driven by the internet, which leads to the sort of conferences that I referred to in Singapore. If you look at the dark blue line at the top there, 
That's the rising US output. But if you look at the paler blue area towards the bottom of the screen, that's the US domestic output. That is articles and reviews which have only US domiciled authors on, no international co-author. And you'll see that that's a pretty flat line. So the increase in US output is driven by international co-authorship. The EU is a major collaborator for the US. China is an increasingly important collaborator for the US, as well as a competitor. For the US, international co-authorship is still less than half of the total output. For the UK, it's about two-thirds, and that's fairly typical of Western Europe. If we look at the US, uh, UK, Netherlands, Sweden, France, Germany, then we see that roughly two-thirds of the papers with a UK author also have an international co-author. If we look at the University of Cambridge or Imperial or Edinburgh, then it's closer to three quarters of the papers published by researchers in those universities have an overseas co-author. So that makes it also, again, very difficult to separate out the IP that belongs to different places, very difficult to identify credit to individual authors because of the complexity of authorship, very difficult to identify who owns the IP which poses an interesting problem for domestic research investment. Why are we putting all this money in when we don't even own the outcomes? And we have an accelerating pace of research. This is the timeline for work on the genome. From 1953, with the publication of a two-page paper in Nature, by Watson and Crick, based on Rosalind Franklin's work, which demonstrated the double helix structure through an increasing acceleration. In 1990, the aim to sequence one human genome. In 2007, the Thousand Genomes Project, which by 2015 had sequenced over 2,500 human genomes. And the spin-off from that is enormous because it's no longer just about genetics research. It also feeds into areas of microbiology, molecular biology, pharmacology, and archaeology. So it goes all over the place. Because of the value of the research enterprise, of which the publishing of results is a critical part, Research comes under increasingly greater scrutiny. In the 1960s, the Wilson government promised huge investment in research and the phrase, the white heat of the technological revolution. The problem is that governments expect very fast returns. You know that research doesn't operate on that kind of cycle. So in the 1970s, when Labour returned after the Heath government, The mantra then was, for the scientists, the party is over, because the research system had not been able to, deal, to deliver the industrial rejuvenation that had been expected in the 1960s. But people realized, the government had realized, that investment in the research base was the only way in which you were going to get technological competitiveness. The oil crisis, of the 1980s made it very difficult to decide where the money should go because there wasn't enough for the amount of research that was being uh, produced. So a new approach to accountability came in with the first selectivity exercise in 1986, which then led to the research assessment exercise in 1992 and successive cycles since then. And that transformed the research process inside universities. In the 1980s, most universities had a vice-chancellor and a pro-vice-chancellor who were deputized for them when they weren't there. 
In the 1990s, pro-vice chances for research began to appear, research strategy committees, research funding, strategic determination, and the idea that the researcher was an independent person who would solely determine what research they should do and gather resources for it began to dilute towards research as a strategic, managed enterprise in universities as well as in research institutes. The research assessment system was very successful in the UK and it led to the adoption of research management, research evaluation uh, worldwide and I'll come back to that. But it led to other changes as well. One of the things about the research assessment exercise which is interesting is that each researcher is allowed to submit four items. It's selective. In the first research selectivity exercise, people submitted their entire CVs, which was completely unmanageable. On the process now, people choose which of their outputs they're going to submit. And what we can see here is how that choice changed over successive exercises. So we go through 92, 96, 2001, 2008, and through to 2014. There's a number of different forms of output that people can put in. Journal articles, which are the green wedges. Conference proceedings, which are red. Books and chapters, which are blue. And other forms of output, like videos, compositions, uh, installations, and so on, which are purple. And what you can see is that back in 1992, the engineers submitted a great deal of conference proceedings. The social scientists submitted many monographs. And gradually, over successive cycles, that shifted so that the engineers first started submitting many more journal articles. Then the social scientists began to move out of monographs and submit more journal articles. So the perception on the part of the individual researcher about what constitutes the best kind of evidence of research excellence apparently transformed under the pressures of assessment that the peer perception of what was evidence of highest quality in 1992 no longer stood up as the ideal submission by 2014. Another change which went on in the system was this. This is the, when people submit material to a research assessment, they do so within a census period prior to the assessment. This is the time spread across years of what people submitted. And you can see that if we go back to the 1992 cycle in orange, over on that side, that it was mostly very recent items. And it was still in 93, uh, sorry, 96, which is the blue items. There's a very, very unhelpful time scale along the bottom there. But gradually, as we shift through, to the data on the right-hand side in purple for the 2014 REF, you can see that that time skew disappears. The recency bias becomes flattened. So again, we start off back in 92 with researchers making assumptions that my best work is my most recent work. By the time we get to 2014, what they're identifying as their best work for submission to an assessment panel is now much more nuanced. And I'm putting these up not because these are important in themselves, but because they are evidence of the extent to which in a competitive system under assessment pressure, people's perceptions of what is high quality, what is evidence of excellence, will shift. And this, of course, is part of what's happening in the minds of the people who review work for journals, who review grant proposals, who also 
make decisions about appointments and who manage the system. Uh, this is just a, a quick reminder about how, uh, well, just the, the, the under-assessment, the UK's average category normalized citation impact improved. It was dropping down in the 1980s. The RE started in 92, and you can see then how it rises. But it rises at the same time as international collaboration, which may also have contributed to that outcome. And one further pressure on the system, the parasites leeching off all the assessment work and the data available around are rankings, which now spread the comparability and the competitiveness from a national research environment to an international research environment. Rankings largely driven by research information, particularly publication information, and starting off as something which was an interesting read on a Friday afternoon and in the bin by Monday morning, have become a huge business in themselves, influencing the ways in which university councils think about the way their institutions should be managed. The rankings criteria that start off as indicators end up as objectives for universities to drive towards. And that's never a good thing. And then, as I mentioned, uh, impact agenda going on in the background. Now, none of these things are necessarily bad in themselves, but they build up to profound changes in the climate in which research is taking place, the ecosystem in which we operate, the pressures which are placed on the researchers, the funders, the research managers, the publishers of research outputs, and the way in which they interact together. Because the criteria that happily worked back in the days when the cricket team was on a steamer, the slow boat to Australia, no longer hold. The value systems are different. And we're now faced with this high-tech, fast world. And then onto that, we throw open access. A shift which is ostensibly a good idea that publicly funded research should be publicly accessible. But where the shift in decision making and in management is another element of disturbance and potentially disruption to that research system. The system is already very complex because of the levels of international collaboration and the speed with which people can communicate with one another and the way in which they can collaborate across the world. The volume has hugely increased and the system that produces research outcomes has accelerated enormously. So people are now able to do things, especially if they're working with collaborators on the other side of the world, on a much faster timetable than they ever did in the past. And then a disruption to university research management, which puts additional pressures on researchers, what they do, how they make decisions about the research they should do next, how they make decisions about what and where they should publish, and what the criteria are that judge the quality of what they're doing. And I think that that means that the contemporary global judgment of what is worthy has shifted problematically. We've seen that in some of the data I've shown you, but there is an undercurrent as well of people who have seen how the criteria are changing and are manipulating the system from within. And you'll be conscious of where that is happening, but that's what presents us with a further challenge. How are we going to exercise our role as gatekeepers to maintain the quality of a system which has undoubtedly been absolutely central to providing wealth creation and the quality of life that people now enjoy. 
the research system that has operated through the 20th century has transformed people's lives. But it can't go on doing that if more noise is creeping into the system, if the research climate is deteriorating, if we are unable to tell what is truth in what is appearing and being published. And there are too many incentives now driving corrupt behavior. Key actors are complicit in this. University research managers are not operating in the way in which the academy would once have expected. The problem is, how do we resist this? The problem is that undoubtedly there are some editors who see opportunities for their journal which are not entirely in the interests of the research system as a whole. There are publishers who are probably aware of editorial behavior, which is not ideal in terms of conventional values, but are reluctant to suppress what is otherwise good for their publishing house. But we all have to work together in order to identify and respond to these negative influences. Because if we don't do this, then the system which has benefited us and has benefited everybody else out there and has certainly benefited the people who created this building and the medical and health system in this country which has benefited enormously from research and research publication will inevitably disintegrate. Thank you very much for your time. Questions? Hi, Katrina McCallum, uh, Hindawi. Thank you very much. I'm not sure whether I'm understanding your, your narrative and thesis correctly, but you're, you're essentially saying, and I think I agree with you, that the, the values of the past have somehow got conflated with um, speed and impact at the expense of of what you, you perceive as the inherent quality that existed in the past. Um, so, so I have a couple of issues with that. One of, one of them is that what do you define as quality? And what does quality mean in a world where we can actually um, collaborate internationally and globally, despite the many challenges of IP, um, uh, and we have the ability to share data and information. Um, to, and that is, you know, can potentially contribute to understanding some of the world's greatest problems at the moment. And yet, you, my sense was that you, you feel open access is a bad thing, um, that you feel that quality somehow, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it's tied up with, but I can't see where research integrity and collaboration and diversity fits in and I may have just misunderstood because I think we might actually agree <laughs> um, in the same things that we've sort of lost the plot and what is scholarship in, in the 21st century um, but my sense was that open access open science um, is an imperative and yes there are problems and parasites as you call them as there are with insurance and banking scams but that is not a reason to rethink the way we look at quality and impact, excellence, and how we evaluate research and include all those measures of openness and collaboration as part of that. <coughs> well, thank you for the question. Uh, and I suspect you were being very charitable in suggesting that the thesis was not yet entirely clear. Um, I think it's that what, what, what I pulled together are a, a lot of different things that are worrying me about what's happening in the system. And I think that we're getting beyond the climate change analogy was, was not entirely um, spurious in the sense that I think you're, you're largely conscious of many of these changes going on, but they, they appear to be background changes in the system. 
My view is that they're, they're adding up to a much more serious and disruptive level of change. The particular thing which has, has I think, disrupted uh, the, the, the uh, original sense of, of, of valuing research publications and, uh, and I think the, the two bits of evidence I gave about the shift in uh, mode of output that was submitted and the shift in, in, in um, uh, time from recency towards a, 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 a more uh, even spread. Um, these, these are driven by people's awareness of citation data. In the early 1990s, hardly anyone was conscious that citation information could be used in some way to index individual publications. It wasn't until after the 1996 research assessment exercise in this country uh, that publications appeared um, in Science and Nature analyzing uh, the UK data and comparing the UK's citation performance with other countries. And so from the late 1990s onwards, people became more and more aware of what these citation indexes might be used for, not only to identify an individual publication that others had used a lot and you might want to therefore look at, but, but actually to put a number on papers. And because you could put a number on papers, in journals, they appear to be more important than books and conference proceedings, and so the engineers started to shift away from their conference proceedings into their journal articles, because you could put a number on those, and similarly the social scientists changed. And then citation data started to get used for other things in the, uh, the ranking systems, in highly cited researchers, which is used intensively by Shanghai Xiaotong, in theirs. So being highly cited became a value in itself. The question then was, how do you produce enough papers and get enough citations to those papers? And so the potential for corrupting the system in all sorts of ways. How do I get my papers into journals that are likely to be well cited? How do I make sure that my papers are highly cited? How do I produce a publication record of that kind? And gradually, the values in the system change from the qualities that I think Katrina was referring to towards something much more reductionist, much more simplistic, much more stark, but one in which you, if you choose to be a uh, perverse presence in the system, uh, can manipulate what's going on. And I think that that's one of our, our fundamental problems. And um, I speak as uh, a, an employee of Clarivate and Weber Science, and we produce uh, citation indices. And I think citation information is incredibly valuable. But I think it can also be a, a, a problematic influence, and that is one of the factors that has played into this and which we have to be aware of. But the general thesis is beyond that. It's, it's also the, you know, wh wh why has that become important? And that's the level of competition because of the numbers of people in the system, because of the level of activity. How do you get noticed when there's so much being published in so many different places? Uh, how do you secure a, 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 a job for the future? And that all leads to this, 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 this catastrophic buildup of pressure which then makes it very, very difficult for us to determine what is the most interesting, useful, and valuable material that has recently been published. Hello, um, I'm Jennifer Smith from St. George's University of London. Um, thank you for a, a very interesting talk. Um, when you said towards the end, how is gatekeepers, do we exercise control? I'm just wondering who, who are the gatekeepers? Who is the we that you're defining there as gatekeepers? Where, do, where and how do researchers themselves fit into that if they want to use these sort of disruptive uh, technologies? 
And then possibly, do you think things like open peer review are a good idea? So that's possibly being greedy with three questions. So yeah, who, who are the we and the gatekeepers? Where do the researchers fit in? And what about if they want to do things like open peer review? Thank you. Well, <coughs> some of you may be familiar with a book called um, Academic Tribes and Territories by a guy called Tony Beecher. And uh, that had a big influence on, on my thinking about um, uh, the research system and, and academia. And he identifies as the most important gatekeepers, uh, publishers, editors, and reviewers. That, that they are the critical groups of people who decide whether or not new material should be admitted to the validated corpus of knowledge, which is, is really what we're talking about here as, as the important thing, the value thing. And of course, the editors and, and reviewers are, are largely drawn from the ranks of, of, of researchers themselves. So it's the research system managing itself. Um, and, and certainly that's, that's, that's the way it should be, that people um, should uh, be expert in, 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 in what they're, they're working on. But they're the people who determine what can be published. But I think in, in looking ahead, it's a slightly wider remit than that, that actually we require responsible behavior from a much wider group of people. We require responsible behavior from university research managers, and we certainly don't see that everywhere at the moment. The <coughs> publisher role may have been very background in the past. I think it has to be more foreground. Publishers need to take a lot more interest in what their editors are doing. Editors must come under scrutiny. It's not, I think, my job to tell you about all the things that you can do to exercise that kind of scrutiny, because I know that many of you are using very good systems for monitoring what goes through uh, your, your channels. But I think it's also up to us. When we're looking at the system as a whole and we're looking across a wide range of journals and publishing houses and geographies to report to you in rather more effective ways than we've done in the past on what we see and so that we help you to understand how your journals and the material in them fit into a wider system. What are the benchmarks? What is typical behavior? How do I identify something that's aberrant? So in terms of where are the gatekeepers, we're, we're all responsible. And we're all responsible for supporting those who are at the sharp end, who I think ultimately are still the editors and reviewers. Thank you very much for your time. I know we've, we've all got like 20 more questions we'd like to ask, but I'm going to be ruthless about the timekeeping, I'm afraid. Um, but thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Judging by Twitter, um, uh, impressive and provocative to equal measures, so that's great. I'm just going to ask Laura to come up now and uh, to tell you about the workshops and send you off on your way. Mm -hmm.